and uh, we're uh, one of our members that we are most proud of, uh, Dr. Marquez. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Uh, most of you can tell me about Dr. Marquez, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I was selected to have the honor, which I clearly would not turn down. So uh, she goes back a long time with UAB, currently a professor and uh, interim, she was just for a month ago, interim director uh, of the lab medicine division and uh, took many roles in addition to her, uh, seems forever, uh, role of director of the transfusion medicine uh, section, uh, which uh, uh, just tells you that she built the whole thing. One thing I noticed is you did not do a fellowship in transfusion medicine. There was and, no uh, funding when I applied. So uh, so that's, uh, we probably have to go back now and see what we can do because uh, <laughs> we trained so many fellows. But, yeah, uh, but, uh, but, but I, it, took the, I took the boards through the experience round, which is no longer- That's, like that's called grandfathering, which I, I'm almost <laughs> as much to blame for a lot of my, uh, uh, my we boards. Need so. blame, we need to blame Dr. Alexander. He said, oh, I gave the, sp the money to a, no a new resident so you can train. I said, okay, thanks to Dr. Wang, I still, I'm still here. <laughs> so it tells us, so for the fellows and residents, you don't always have to do a fellowship. You can just be a leader in the field while you're a resident and then you become the director and one of the most famous transfusion medicine <laughs> authority in the country, which is uh, really not an exaggeration. I'm proud of everything uh, we have here and every fellowship and all the people who are here or left. And uh, we don't hold grudges on these people who left, uh, including Lance and Long and, uh, and Fran. But, uh, but we're proud of everyone. But I'm really most proud of Marisa's accomplishments and, and what she brings to the institution and the department and for the pedigree that she built uh, throughout the nation for UAB. And the name UAB Pathology is, is uh, really linked uh, to few names uh, uh, for me even before I joined here and she's certainly on the top of the list and uh, and that's uh, due to many qualities not only uh, the ultimate academician and uh, the the great leader that she is and very knowledgeable very hardworking, attention to education passion about education so before she did her residency here uh, she did the internal medicine residency uh, in uh, Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre in Brazil and uh, and then just as a career path, people always ask me, how do you get to a successful career path? You should ask Marissa, but look at the list of, of uh, investments she made. She was at the NIA, she was at Beth Israel, at Brigham and Women, uh, many uh, fellowships uh, there for a year uh, before she joined even UAB and did the residency. And she has risen through the ranks. She's been a full professor since 2008. And uh, the list of committees and, uh, and honors and accolades that she has uh, is mind boggling. Around 32 awards, many of them. Uh, we are so proud that she uh, obtained these awards. Dean's Excellence Award in Teaching uh, for Senior Faculty just last year. Argus Society Award for Best Lecturer. Uh, AMWA, which is the American Medical Women Association Excellence and Mentorship Award, uh, Klaus Mayet uh, for, uh, Award from Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering, uh, and a list goes on and on. Publications are over 200 uh, original publications, many books. Uh, some of the books, uh, she, uh, she got some of the people in the audience uh, uh, to launch their career with her on, uh, and many chapters. So I don't want to take, uh, I could take the whole uh, 45 minutes, <laughs> <Please don't. laughs> uh, but uh, we couldn't be uh, more proud of Marissa and uh, we uh, were grateful to everything she's done. And her lecture today, uh, apparently paying tribute to somebody, I hope is on the call, and uh, that about uh, what our role uh, in, uh, in AFERIS is that she's uh, going to talk uh, and share with us. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Dr. Meadow. And yes, please give me time. I, as always, I have a lot to say and a lot of slides. And first of all, of course, I would love to have done this in person. And before the pandemic was in the horizon, 
I had a plan to have a live event to honor Dr. Wong and, you know, an important anniversary that we celebrated in, in 2020 that I wanted to celebrate in person with all of you and many other people. But unfortunately, the pandemic is not going away. And there was a call for uh, topics for Grand Rounds. And I said, I want to do this. So uh, I hope I hope you enjoy and uh, and you learn something about what ha what has happened at UAB thanks to Dr. Wang. So let's see it. Here is uh, here is my first slide. Can you see my first slide? Yes. Oh, I wow. wonder if you should switch to, uh, okay. to the presentation so that's mode. That's what I need to see. Where do I go there again? I guess you uh, are in presentation mode. Okay. Am I on presentation mode? Just one sure. slide? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. So there's Dr. Wang on his retirement in 20, 2010. I need to, um, this is my, uh, I don't have any disclosures. So let's start with the, in the year 1980. Dr. Wang had been here for two years. He was the medical director of the blood bank. He was for, originally from Taiwan. He had trained in New York City. The population of Birmingham and Jefferson County at the time was actually higher than it is right now. Slightly, but you can see in the two graphs at the bottom. But the population of the state of Alabama that we serve as the main hospital in the state was 28% lower than it is today. 3.9 million in 2020, 5 million individuals. You might be surprised to know that four important things that happened in 1980 uh, were, were that CNN started. 3M introduced the post-it notes that we still used. Apparently that was an accident. We eradicated the smallpox. Maybe we'll one day eradicate uh, COVID. And I remember really well when John Lennon was assassinated in, uh, in December, December 8th, 1980. At that point, uh, our department had 33 faculty members. Dr. Wang is at the bottom there as an assistant professor, as uh, is Dr. Uh, Robinson, who is still here, and Dr. Grizzle, who is right above Dr. Uh, Wang. There's also Dr. Alexander, who was also an assistant professor. Dr. Geert was the, um, uh, the chair, and Dr. Cole was the vice chair. These two individuals, came to, uh, to Dr. Wang's surprise at a 30 years anniversary celebration in 2008 that I was very excited to put together. I had to lie to him to go to the reception that there was a patient that wanted to see him again. He kept asking me about the, the labs that that patient had the disease. I told him the patient had a, um, a recurrent TTP and he kept saying, what's the play Lacan? What's this? We were in the elevator and I kept making things up because I knew to take him to the ninth floor where the Camellia Pavilion is to, for this celebration, which was a wonderful tribute to his 30th anniversary at UAB. And Dr. Gear and Dr. Cole attended then as some of you that are still here, not many. Well, December 18th, 19, 1980, at 8 p.m., was the very first day for this procedure at UAB. <laughs> we found this by chance when we were cleaning the blood bank and we found the book for the residents and all the young people now that are so used to computer uh, documentation, which should, is the way to go now. Back then, right, Dr. Wang, it was written by hand. Look at this, procedure number one, uh, using a machine that was three generate, th the, the, the first generation of machine of the Opti that we use today. At 8 p.m., they started the very first procedure of the UAB uh, aphoresis service, and it was a plasma exchange. Well, what is aphoresis? I thought, because this is a general audience, some of you may not be familiar with that, so uh, bear with me, those of you that know it by heart. Aphoresis is a procedure in which blood is collected, usually with a machine, like this is the new generation of that one used back in 1980. It's called the Optia. This is the, in, this is the front of the Optia, like a, uh, like a uh, um, um, snapshot. 
uh, the blood is collected from the patient, goes inside the machine, and then a portion of the blood for plasma exchange, as Dr. Wang did first, the plasma is uh, collected in this bag and discarded, and the patient's plasma is replaced either with albumin or donor plasma. We can also we use the same machine to collect stem cells. We, we, a similar machine is used to collect platelets for donations, so on and so forth. So apheresis is this uh, procedure that is used in mul for multiple diseases. I would be remiss if I didn't start by thanking the people that actually run the machines. Uh, all of us physicians that have had the privilege of learning how to do apheresis from Dr. Wang and, and others would not be able to treat a, a single patient. I'm not, Dr. Wang actually probably did know how to run the machine, I don't. The, he originally trained medical technologists that worked in the blood bank to run the procedures because he worried that perhaps there wouldn't be enough patients to, to require dedicated aphoresis specialists. So uh, this model worked from 1980 to 2013 when the volume of work increased. There were several different things happened and our medical technologists that were trained in aphoresis became only blood bank. Uh, but, focused on their blood bank role. In the, uh, during lab week in 2014, Dr. Wang came uh, and we had a luncheon to celebrate the ones that were still here. So some of you that, had, that were here before will recognize Sarah, Lance, Daniel, Pat, Cindy, and Andrea. They were all lab medical technologists that took care of the patients, stayed at the bedside while we physicians were uh, um, overseeing those procedures. We cannot, we, we cannot thank them enough, as well as our current group of nurses. We have a group of 10, close to 10, give or take, uh, full-time nurses that work as our aphoresis specialists. This picture was taken uh, on December 18th, 2020, the exact anniversary, 40th anniversary of the aphoresis service, which is what I wanted to celebrate. And my initial goal back in 2018 and 2019 was to have a party on that day. Unfortunately, as, as you know, we could not have had that in person. So that's why we're today celebrating what we've ha what ha we have accomplished as the UAB Aphoresis Service that's now 41 years old, actually. So to give you an idea of how many patients are treated and what they have, I decided to show this, uh, this table from a paper that was published already uh, five, five years ago. The first author, Stephen Mann, is now, a, a, um, he was a medical student and he's a resident in pathology in Indiana, you recognize the second author there. I'm not even going to uh, suggest that no one knows who Dr. McCluskey is, but Brandy and Steve, me and Jill, who, who was our faculty member at the time and is now at the Mayo Clinic, uh, put together the, a 10-year 10, 10 registry of aphoresis patients. So the, the point here is that about 100 patients a day, a year are treated at UAB. Uh, they ranged at that point in age from three to 92. So we treat a number of diseases that I'll go into a little bit in just a minute. Um, in that, that 10 year period, we had done almost 12,000 procedures and, and with a median average, uh, median number of 11. Although you can see that some people received one in, the, in one treatment only and others up to 137, but the median but the median is five um, uh, as shown there. So plasma exchange, that first procedure that Dr. Wang started in 1980 is also called TPE. So we're gonna talk, use TPE more from now on because it's shorter. TPE is the most common procedure we, use, we do at UAB. This is from Steve's, Steven's paper as well. Um, uh, it's the number of TPE procedures per year. Since 2012, have, our numbers have increased, but nobody has actually looked to see uh, how, how many they, they are. So uh, I, I wanted to show you data that had been painstakingly collected because Steven went through every aphoresis book that we had because we we still had a lot of manual documentation. Uh, there are other, uh, other procedures that we're gonna talk about. Uh, and, and at this talk, I'm only going to uh, mention 
ECP, which is extracorporeal photophoresis, because as you see, uh, um, Dr. Wang's vision and the UAB Aphoresis Service have had a significant um, impact in how much we, we've, we've used and in the role of, of uh, TPE as well as ECP. But uh, uh, I, can, I can assure uh, you that the other ones have had uh, uh, have also uh, contributed to patient care. And, uh, and for the residents that are watching, you can notice that uh, red cell exchanges were not performed very often in the past. Now we perform 18 of them a week, but that back then uh, it was not uh, common because we didn't have the outpatients that we do have. So currently our patient mix has changed, but uh, but our the 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 role the, our our role in patient care hasn't uh, uh, diminished in or, or in any way. So plasma exchange or TPE is used for a number of diseases, usually autoimmune conditions. And uh, before you ask uh, uh, what what why. 1980 was Dr. Wang started. Well, that machine that Dr. Wang used was uh, um, released into the market as the main first, the first commercially available in instrument to perform aphoresis in 1977. And in the 70s was when the papers that literature had exploded with, well, not exploded, but shown more, more cases of the role of plasma exchange in autoimmune conditions. So you see in this list of the top five indications for, um, for TPE, that uh, two of the top five are myosti are, uh, uh, autoimmune, um, autoimmune con uh, neurologic conditions like myasthenia gravis and CIDP. But, uh, but but we also uh, we we also treat uh, all autoimmune conditions like solid organ transplant rejections, um, uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which is a little bit of a confusing uh, um, uh, pathogen condition in terms of pathogenesis. But let me let, from now on uh, for several slides, I'm going to focus on the top condition: thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Because, uh, because UAB is a referral center for that because of Dr. Wunk. So that first patient on the December 18th, 1980, that starting at 8 p.m., had TTP. Uh, TTP is an autoimmune condition. Uh, many of you remember uh, that uh, Long Zhang gave some beautiful talks about the, the pathogenesis when, when Long was here. He's a well-known uh, expert in TTP. It's an autoimmune, uh, uh, it's an, an, an autoantibody that causes deficiency of an enzyme uh, called ADAMTS13. In the absence of the enzyme, the von Willebrand's factor, uh, which is released from the endothelial cells remains really large. It uh, spontaneously binds platelets and these platelet thrombi cause end organ damage, such as the, 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 the um, such as uh, uh, heart attacks and, and, and unfortunately death. And this, uh, the, the bottom picture here is, uh, is from an autopsy that Yara Park, who I'll mention again later, Yara was our medical student, is now a full professor at UNC. Uh, Yara did an autopsy of an unfortunate patient with TTP that came in the day after Thanksgiving and did not survive long enough for us to start the first plasma exchange. She died as we were walking into her room um, but it's a beautiful uh, uh, and sad example of these platelet thrombi in 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 in, uh, in, in important organs, um, because of the platelet because the platelets are lost in the in the tissue, the they are gone from the peripheral blood. So this picture taken by Dr. Wang shows the absence of platelets in the peripheral blood of these patients, uh, which have severe thrombocytopenia. And these, uh, he, this uh, microangiopathic uh, picture with all these fragmented red cells as they go through these platelet thrombi throughout the body. Turns out that 90% of patients die from TTP and sometimes really fast without plasma exchange. So Dr. Wang knew we needed to start the uh, aphoresis service here because TPE was essential. 
even though this that was 11 years before the, the randomized control trial in the New England Journal of Medicine proved that TPE decreased mortality to only about 10 to 15 percent. Still, people die, but much less. So I'm going to go over a, a number, uh, uh, a few selected publications on TTP from UAB. We've had many more than that, but each one of them has a little history behind. So the very first one is a very small uh, a publication. The first one that I wrote about TTP, this is a picture that my husband scanned from a picture that I had with Dr. Wang and I from 1999. So in this page, in this paper, I, uh, this paper was the beginning of what we uh, created as our TTP database. We, I only included 15 patients from the year before I started uh, uh, in the faculty, uh, which was uh, in 1998. Took a couple of years to get it published. Those years were, uh, were, were, were a lot of clinical work, um, but, uh, but the, 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 the um, the importance of this one is that it's the very first TTP paper from UAB. This next one is uh, included 90 patients and uh, Hundred Tunser was our fellow. She was my first fellow when I became a program director in 2003. She's a hemonc doctor in Boston. Um, um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, reasons this paper is important to mention is that uh, for the first time, uh, a, a series of patients with TTP mentioned smoking as a risk factor to develop this disease. Uh, Dr. Wang always said smokers do worse, smokers do worse. And <laughs> Dr. James George from Oklahoma Blood Institute uh, pointed out uh, uh, to me that nobody else had thought of that before, and that might have been, that, that may be important in the pathogenesis. Um, Yara Park again, um, uh, when she was a resident here and she finished in 2007, as you'll see it a little bit later. Uh, uh, Yara uh, wrote a paper with me and Mike Waldrum, who was uh, the director of the I uh, MICU at the time. Uh, on, uh, on, on how we could dif quickly differentiate uh, patients with TTP in HUS, which we called them together at the time. I'll explain that in a little bit, from DIC. So it turns out for the people that are not familiar with this history that we had known since 1998, actually the year I started in the faculty in November, there were two papers in the New England Journal showing that there was a deficiency of, of uh, Adam TS-13 in patients with TTP. The, uh, the, unfortunately, the availability of that test to diagnose was, 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 was not there. We could order the test and wait five, six days to, for it to come back. Initially, it wasn't even commercially available. So for many years, even after we knew what TT, how TTP was caused, we did not know how to make the diagnosis fast enough. Uh, I already told you that that patient that Yara did the autopsy back in, uh, in I think 2004, died even before we started plasma exchange and she was admitted just a few hours earlier. So for, a, for, for several years, there were publications from, uh, from UAB and, and other places trying to, to determine how, how we could quickly with the information we have from, a, from simple lab tests like CBC and, and, and COAGs to differentiate a life-threatening disease like TTP from another life-threatening disease like DIC, but one that doesn't require plasma exchange. That patients with TTP need to be referred to a place like ours with availability for, for plasma exchange 24-7. And, uh, and so several people um, have used this paper as, as a, as a uh, uh, helpful in, in their ability to, to, to diagnose these patients quickly and refer them for a place that can treat them. A um, couple of years later, Jason Braselton, Brandy, Jessica, who was a medical student, Jill, myself, Robert Oster was a, a, a statistician. Uh, we published this paper about the, how these patients could be monitored and, pre, and, and, and perhaps um, know which ones are at high, high risk of dying. So it, uh, Jason uh, 
looked at all the, our patients that had died in a in a, in 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 the period of several years, and and realized that all of them had either very high troponin I on admission or very high troponin I once they were admitted, and that was associated with fatal outcome. Uh, to this day, we look at troponin I when a patient is admitted and say this patient needs to be monitored because that high troponin may uh, represent the burden of ischemia that they have um, in, in, in their heart muscle, which is what this uh, picture is showing. Turns out that Jason actually presented that, uh, that uh, uh, those data uh, a few years earlier uh, as an abstract for, in an abstract form at the ASFA uh, annual meeting in Atlanta in 2012 and received the Therapeutic Aphoresis Best Abstract Award. Jason is now a pathologist at the University of Vermont and, um, yeah, and we're very proud of, of his uh, accomplishments. <laughs> Um, Yao Lin Zhao, who is also a pathologist now in, in, the, in North Carolina, uh, published this, in, this paper that we wanted to, to share uh, with, with, the, uh, with, the clinic, with the clinical teams <laughs> that not only patients with TTP have, uh, have a heart, uh, heart ischemia, but they can have ischemia in other organs. And, uh, and, and this an unfortunate patient died from this massive um, um, so, um, uh, small intestine uh, ischemic event. And you can see here, since this is specialist is where pathologists, I wanted to show you some gross pictures and some microscopic pictures. The, 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 this is a, um, it, this is a picture of his surgically resected small bowel that still didn't prevent him from dying from it. And uh, in the submucosa, you can see all these uh, uh, um, platelet-rich uh, trombi in the inset on the left side here. So uh, even though they die mainly from heart, uh, from heart uh, um, ischemia, they also suffer from ischemia and other, many other organs. And uh, I need to acknowledge that uh, Stephanie Riley and Dr. Reddy uh, from, uh, from, from our department and Radhika who is in, in, in hematology were also involved in this presentation. Um, when Dr. Lima was a resident, he worked with me and, uh, and Jill and, uh, and a Himonka and a medicine resident uh, to put this together. It turns out that in 2003, um, that, uh, we started seeing um, reports of the use of rituximab in this autoimmune condition. Remember, rituximab is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. And... Um, and it seemed like it helped patients with TTP, but then we, 10 years later, we knew that some of them came back with another episode. So we wanted to show that rituximab was helpful, uh, but it was not, it would not cure this disease. So we, that was a, a, a publication in 2013. When Lance was here, uh, we, um, we, we, uh, we contributed to an AJCP series of, of papers that we had started with ACLIP several years earlier on pathology consultation articles. So Lance and I wrote this paper on pathology consultation, the diagnosis and treatment of thrombotic microangiopathies, which is a general term for TTP and HUS and others. Um, you'll see from now on a few of these uh, blurbs on the, on, on, uh, in, the, in, in green. Um, I'm a member of ResearchGate. I suggest that uh, our junior faculty members uh, should consider doing that because you can, you have some, um, you can use the number of citations of your papers and even the number of people reading your papers and where they're from uh, in, in your promotion packages as, um, as, as um, um, uh, examples of being nationally recognized if you show that people are reading your papers all over the country. I was very surprised. I didn't realize that this one last was, has been read as of yesterday by almost 1400 people that research gate knows. I'm sure many other people read, read on paper and we don't, we don't know that. 
Um, the most uh, um, the most uh, cited uh, paper from UAB uh, TTP efforts before we get into Long Zhang's uh, 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 period at UAB was this Lancet paper. So it turns out that the Harvard Medical School has a Harvard TMA group. The authors, the, 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 many of the people that participate in that are friends of mine from the community, from our community of blood bankers. And they, uh, they set up to create a, a score for the rapid assessment of patients with traumatic microangiopathies. They created a score, they derived a score from their own patients and they needed an external validation of that score. And that's where um, um, UAB participated. Our, our patients that had been, our, our database that we had been accumulating for several years, close to 20 years by that point, uh, served to, to validate that score. And uh, the person that collected most of the data was Ashley Fry, who was a Hemon fellow actually at the time. She wanted to do some research and, uh, and she and I became um, authors of this paper that was uh, published in Lancet, which is the most cited UAB paper on TTP. Currently, it, when patients present with what looks like TTP, uh, hopefully uh, physicians all over the country will go, will, will know about this or will Google something and will find this, uh, this uh, website uh, for the Harvard TMA uh, plasmic score. And if they answer as I answered here and they get six points, then they are told that the patient has a high risk for TTP. They need to send the adaptive team testing, which is not going to be available immediately. They need to obtain a, a, a expert consultation. And this is where our talk uh, uh, relates to the immediate plasma exchange of high clinical suspicion for TTP. So Dr. Long Zhang, who is here today with us, uh, we're very excited to have him, um, was a very well-established TTP researcher at CHOP in 2015 when he chose to come to UAB to be a laboratory medicine division director. It, when he was a fellow at, uh, at Wash U in 2001 in, uh, in Evan Sadler's lab, a very famous uh, hematologist, he had described the Adam Tiastor gene uh, um, enzyme structure. When he came to UAB, he brought some, uh, some of his research uh, group, and then he, he added some more here. They are pictured in here. But he was, but according to what he's told us, and he can deny or not, I think he will not, he was, he was looking to come to a place where we, it was a referral center for TTP patients, because a lot of the studies that uh, followed used some of the, uh, the, the specimens and, uh, that we, or plasma that we had collected over the years, and then the ones that we collected subsequently while, while he was here. So to, to say the least, his, uh, his coming to UAB really put uh, uh, us uh, into a, 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 in another dimension in terms of, uh, of our role in TTP uh, research in, in, in clinical care. So one of the first papers that was published was on the pathogenesis of TTP using the specimens that we had been collecting and then the ones we collected prospectively here. So many of the residents and some that are still here and our nurses co helped collect uh, uh, plasma from patients on admission every uh, day, every three days, on discharge, uh, after after discharge, a, a, a lot of people got involved in that, and that was published uh, just a year the year after uh, Long arrived here. In 2019, Dr. Staley, Liz Staley, who was a resident at UAB, trained in apheresis. Uh, trained in transfusional medicine at WashU and is back in town, uh, published uh, another paper uh, on clinical factors and biomarkers that predict the outcome in patients with TTP. Some of the information from her paper and this paper in, from in 19, in the, in also in 2019, have changed how we take care of patients and how we monitor them when we think that they, they're ready to go home. 
um, 2000, and then the most, the most, one of the most recent ones um, is on um, yet more biomarkers that are, can be used to prevent, to predict uh, adverse outcomes of TTP. Our current chief resident AP, Raima, wrote this paper with Long and Dr. Lan from, from Neurology on, uh, on, on, uh, on uh, um, cerebral infarct, on, on risk factors for cerebral infarct, uh, infarction in patients with TTP. And notice that here she, may, she includes smoking again. So smoking has continued to, uh, to be an ish, uh, um, um, a factor or a um, piece of information that Dr. Wong, that go, that's back to Dr. Wang when, when we start, first started uh, talking about why these patients uh, get, uh, have the disease or even how they, they die. Finally, um, there, there are many more papers uh, published, but uh, this is the last one. This is uh, uh, a collaboration with, that long started with our bioinformatics. And uh, in, in, uh, in the, the first uh, paper that describes some genetic uh, basis for, the, for, for TTP, there's a lot more to learn in this regard, but it's a wonderful um, start and uh, and it makes sense because uh, there are lots of uh, observations that point out that some patients are more uh, susceptible to developing this autoimmune disease it's not all acquired uh, and uh, and long can tell us more about it um, uh, at, at later on I'm gonna try to give you time for that Perhaps one of the most important things we've done uh, to uh, directly affect patients, uh, except uh, in addition to taking care of them one patient at a time, is to put together these TTP fairs. So from 2016 to 2019, uh, Long's research group led by Nikki Coker, who is here in, uh, in, in this picture and in all the others, um, organized a fair where we invited patients, their family members to meet with us three times in Birmingham in 16, 17, and 18, and one time in Montgomery where many of them live. And uh, we answered their questions, we heard their stories, and uh, we even were even able to get some uh, uh, blood for some of the studies. As in this picture here, you can see Morgan is one of our aphoresis nurses. Several of them volunteered in different times. In the middle picture here, we see three other nurses. Uh, the, the, these patients signed consent and were very happy to participate in this truly cutting edge research that long started here uh, is to understand the pathogenesis of the disease, but also the genetic basis. So uh, I chose uh, from, from many, many different pictures, I chose some to, to show you how we had, uh, we, we had round tables, talk to the patients. Some of us in the middle posed for a picture. Uh, and uh, here is, uh, um, Morgan collecting blood from a patient, um, long uh, lands in a, pa in, a, in a patient. At the bottom here, I met this patient and we had treated many, many years ago. Some of them were like a reunion. It was wonderful opportunity. This, the, the, the last picture here at the, on the bottom left includes a, a long and a family that has created a foundation to take care, to, to create a support group for patients. Um, it's the ReWin Foundation. ReWin was a young lady that uh, was the daughter of this couple. She died from TTP in 2012 in, in um, Pennsylvania. And before, before she was able to have the plasma exchange, her parents, her husband, her sister have created this amazing foundation uh, to provide education and promote awareness. The, it, from, my, from my standpoint, what they 
do the most is they support patients. And I've been lucky to be invited to participate in some of their support group meetings. So you can see their, their, uh, on, uh, their um, tweet here from two years ago saying that uh, uh, they had invited me, I, they, uh, they had questions, we had a, a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of interaction. And then just recently, just uh, last month, um, they had uh, a, another virtual what, uh, meeting that they have every year for several years now. Um, and so I did this from my living room. Um, they, they, they do a gift of life at home session for two hours on Saturday afternoon to uh, answer questions, to recognize people that have been champions in the, in the, in the uh, patient side of, um, of, of, of TTP. So I, uh, I cannot tell you how honored I am to have participated as long has and probably several others of you. Um, so this is my last slide on TTP. I'm going to move on, but I think that we're gonna leave questions for the end. So as a, as a, uh, a connector, uh, I wanna show you a few pictures here of Dr. Wang during his 30th year anniversaries with several, several people that were uh, previous aphoresis uh, um, uh, specialists. I believe that uh, one of these two uh, uh, women here on the left, uh, I guess you can see my, my uh, arrow, right? They were here when Dr. Wang started uh, uh, the, the, the service in 1980. So I want to talk to you a little bit about extracorporeal photophoresis, which is another major um, uh, co um, contribution of UAB. Uh, we, uh, we were among the first in the US in the world. This, this is unlike plasma exchange where we remove something. Uh, in this case, we are treating the patient cells. We're removing the patient cells and in, in uh, uh, incubating them with a um, light uh, uh, sensitive uh, uh, compound and then irradiating and then returning to the patient. This, this technique is more like immunotherapy modulatory or one that induces tolerance. Uh, and, and, and that's uh, where we participated. So heart transplant rejection is a major problem. And it was even worse back in 1992 when this, this uh, when ECP was, was shown to have some effect. It turns out that ECP was, was approved just a few years earlier for a very rare type of lymphoma called CTCL. But, so, but since this is so rare, it's used much more for, its, for other uh, indications than it is for the original indication. So it's, we, don't, I don't, we don't know for sure exactly when, the, when we started photophoresis here, but when I started as a resident in 1994, we had a couple of dozen of patients with heart and lung transplant rejection. They were undergoing photophoresis, which is usually an outpatient treatment that patients come in over and over and over again, every week, every two weeks and so, or so and so forth. So uh, one of the papers that we have published uh, to help others to understand the role of photophoresis is the one shown here with our, our uh, transplant uh, uh, colleagues, Dr. Kirkland being uh, the main uh, transplant surgeon. In this paper, we showed that, that we were able to show that the, 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 the patients that were started in photo decreased their, the risk of, of uh, rejection significantly compared with the ones that did not have photophoresis. And again, as you can see, this paper has been cited a few times um, uh, since that. Jill Adamski who is uh, shown in this picture with Dr. Wang, was so uh, 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 interested in photophoresis that when Dr. Wang retired in 2010, she uh, gave him a copy, uh, she gave him, her, him this uh, drawing of, uh, of the of a photophoresis effect on heart transplant uh, uh, rejection uh, because she was fascinated by it. So I asked when, when, when the 40th anniversary was about to happen, I asked Dr. Kirkland, what was the role of the aphoresis on his patient, on, for his, in, in his area, in his, for his patients. And this is what he said, I can't, unfortunately time keeps running out, uh, running 
faster than I can keep up with. But he, basically, he said Dr. Wang is an absolute icon in the history of our thoracic uh, transplant program. Not going to read much or everything except say that Dr. Wang was totally leading the early effort and quietly accommodating all of our needs. So if there is one thing that Dr. Wang and I don't share is that he is quiet, he's humble. I'm not. Some years later, Dr. Kirkland said that they thought they had found the magic bullet, for it, which was total lymphoid irradiation. I thought our heme path uh, colleagues would find it interesting that they found out that 15% of patients that had T TLI developed megakaracidic leukemia. So Dr. Kirkland said that he was very thankful when photo was proved so successful. Dr. Borge, who is um, vice chair for the Department of Medicine and was the clinical doctor, the cardiologist that was taking care of these patients, said that uh, we saved our, their patients from, uh, from rejection, in the apheresis team, and, in, and were responsible for the market improvement in survival. After Dr. Wang retired, Jill and I wrote this paper and uh, this review for the journal Clinical Apheresis, who ha which has had 483 uh, uh, reads um, and, uh, and, and one of the most read papers from UAB. Turns out that even though Jill has left UAB, she has continued to be interested in ACP. And she's one of the founding members of this American Council on ACP that had its in, uh, uh, inaugural meeting in 2017. Turns out that uh, we don't know exactly how ECP works, so don't ask me, although Jill is, is here and she could answer. Uh, so there are still lots of things to be, to be discovered. We know that it helps certain patients and, uh, and we're very happy that Jill continued the, tra the UAB tradition on ECP and is one of the members. And as a matter of fact, during that meeting gave a talk on the key players in peripheral tolerance. As, as I think I mentioned, she's been at the Mayo Clinic since 2013, and we're very excited. She's now the chair, the chair of lab medicine uh, in that institution. So to finalize, I want to talk to you about how the apheresis, uh, how Dr. Wang's visions help us to become the people we are today. And one way we did that was through ASFA. ASFA is the American Society for Apheresis. It's a, it's an, it's a premier organization in this country, but also uh, nationally, to, to, whose mission is to advance uh, apheresis medicine for patients, donors, practitioners through education, evidence-based practice, research, and advocacy. So as you recognize, many of you in these pictures, we participate at to, uh, at almost every, uh, um, well, at every ASFA meeting for more than 20 years uh, in many different ways, uh, uh, giving talks, um, uh, submitting, uh, presenting abstracts, uh, and so on and so forth. But more, more objectively, I wanted to show you a couple of specific things that several of us that have been at UAB have done. So when I was in the, in, uh, in the committee that, that started these practice guidelines the way that we have them today, I was, a, I was lucky to be um, an author of the, the first two of the evidence-based guidelines that were published in 2007 and 2010. And then Dr. Pham, who was at UAB uh, a couple of years ago, is now taking the, the role. And uh, he was a member of 2019, and almost certainly he'll be a member of 2023. We have also participated in the consensus conferences. These were the only two consensus conferences that uh, ASFA has put together uh, uh, so far. I, I was part of the one on TTP in Atlanta in 2012. And then Lance was a part of the one in 2015. As, and as you can see, when the paper was written, Lance was the senior author of that paper. And that I would say, I hope he agrees with me, helped launch his uh, career as an aphoresis expert. Uh, he had been here at UAB for two years by that point, almost two years, he came in 2013. We have also chairs uh, uh, of organizing committees. 
we're, I, I think we're proud to, to be the first, to have been the first ones to have the ASFA regional meeting and you in Birmingham in 2011. I was president elect in 2014 of the society and uh, I organized the, uh, the meeting in San Francisco with the World Aphoresis Association. And Yara Park, who was our medical student uh, 20 years ago, uh, is now the president elect of ASFA and is leading with Jill Adamski, the organizing committee for the meeting that hopefully will happen in Philadelphia in May. Not surprisingly, because of all our efforts, we, are luck we have been lucky to receive several awards from ASFA. Jill received the lecture in 2019. I have received some of them. And uh, uh, not made public yet, but I found out that Dr. Pham is about to receive the lecture award in 2022. So go we, this well-deserved. <laughs> I'm going to final finish up with some uh, words to Dr. Wang that some of the people that I have mentioned have sent me. So as I said, Yara uh, Park was a medical student and a resident here. She says to Dr. Wang, without UAB Ephesus program, I would have never found my passion in medicine. She said, even though I left UAB in 20, 2007, there's not a week that goes by that I don't remember something that Dr. Wang taught me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So Yara is not only a, a professor of pathology at UNC, she's the program director of the pathology residency program at UNC. She's also the director of the Transfusion Medicine Services. And she's the one that created the, the Shu T. Wong Award for Excellence in Laboratory Medicine Education, this plaque <laughs> right outside our lab medicine conference room. This is the picture that uh, that, that we took, Dr. Wang was the first recipient of this, of the award named after him when Yara finished her training in 2007. Well, since then, some people have won several of these like Lance Williams who won three years of the six years that he was here. So the, Lance says, Dr. Wang, your teaching award is very coveted in lab medicine because it represents a man that dedicated himself to holistic teaching. To win the award means that you have risen to that challenge in standard. So uh, uh, I should say that Sixto has also won it twice. So uh, so uh, uh, the, the race is on. Uh, so uh, this is a picture of Lance and several residents, several of them you recognize in this picture when he received his award, I believe in this is pictures from 2015. Mark Fung, I haven't mentioned him because Mark was did not uh, uh, was not a fellow or a resident here, but he was a medical student. He's at the University of Vermont and he's a trustee of the American Board of Pathology. He's, he's, he's in the audience. He wanted to say to Dr. Wang that his reasons for going into blood bank is as a specialty was because of his experience when he was a fourth year medical student. He also says, I did not appreciate how fortunate I was at the time when I was there, but look back with fondness and gratitude and my training at UAB. So thank you, Mark, for, for uh, joining us today. Jim Sikora was our fellow a few years ago. He said he didn't meet Dr. Wang, but he's benefited greatly from his vision. He is in charge of transfusion medicine at Grady. This was, his, this was the picture at his graduation uh, almost three years ago now. Marla Troughton was our faculty member from 2007 to 2010. She's a medical director at BioLife now. And uh, she, she appreciated uh, her time here. And she said, Dr. Wang and the Aphoresis Service have been innovative leaders in therapeutic aphoresis. She felt privileged to have been part of it. And we wish she were here. Uh, yeah, still, but uh, this is a picture of when she came back to for Dr. Wang's uh, uh, retirement party. And the other person in the picture, for those of you that were not here then, is Dr. Uh, uh, Roth, who was our, our chair uh, at the time in, in 2010. Dr. Pham uh, also said his, uh, his comments and, uh, and talks about the opportunity, the, the, the care that we provide and the opportunities to train uh, aphoresis specialists. Dr. Pham is now the first medical director of the National Marrow Donor Program in Seattle, uh, a, a new position that was uh, created recently. And then finally, 
uh, long uh, saying says, in my opinion, the UAB first service is one of the best in the nation. It's well organized, comprehensive, high quality. He thanks Dr. Wang for his pioneer work establishing the Aphoresis Service in 1980, and he continues success for our Aphoresis Center. So my final thoughts, uh, some of you may be thinking, well, is this about Dr. Wang? Is this about Marissa? Is this about, who is this about? It is about all of us. And, uh, and I wanna say that when I came to UAB, as Dr. Nato said, I had been at uh, in Boston. I had been uh, doing infectious disease research and I came to UAB because I, was, I wanted to be a clinical microbiologist. There were three clinical microbiologists at UAB at the time. They didn't need another one. I needed a job in Birmingham for my family. So Dr. Wang gave me the opportunity. As Dr. Neto said, I had trained in transfusion medicine. Dr. Wang said, it's okay, I'll teach you. So the rest <laughs> is history. I want you to know how appreciative I am of what he did to me and, and uh, uh, allowed me, uh, it showed me how to love this specialty, allowed me to meet so many young people that we trained or that worked with us and, uh, and uh, are now aphoresis experts themselves. I hope I showed you how well known uh, um, nationally they are nowadays. Uh, and then finally, I wanna show, tell the young people that are joining us today, faculty members, residents, fellows, take every opportunity you find. UAB has amazing resources. You don't have to leave. It's okay if you do, but you don't have to leave to, to build a career. I never left UAB and I don't have any regrets and I've been able to do things I never imagined I could do. So just because you train in one place, it doesn't mean you cannot succeed in that place. I want, that's my plea. We want to retain you guys. We want you to have the best run. And we want you to recognize people like Dr. Wong and many others that will have had a major, um, uh, that will eventually uh, help you build your own successful career. So Dr. Wong, I just want to thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank this you. picture, this picture Wonderful. is, I, I chose this picture because you were at the bedside and this is where you <laughs> showed us we matter the most. We are physicians uh, ultimately and we are lucky enough in this specialty to have to come in in the middle of the night, but <laughs> to be seen by the patient as the doctor that comes to help them. Uh, you exemplified that. You never, sh you never shown away from being on call or, or coming here anytime, day or night. And, uh, and, and, the, and hopefully we were able to continue to, 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 to make you proud of, of, of what you've taught us. So thank you. Sorry that it's only two minutes before one o'clock. So this is my last line. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For... And thank you, Dr. Wang, and, and all the people who mentioned for the contributions to the department, institution, and our patients. And I just refer you to the uh, chat notes uh, uh, for uh, I haven't a, seen what I have uh, What does uh, it say? Great, uh, great comments. I will save them for you. Great comments. Uh, oh, thank okay. you Can, and uh, congratulating you on the great talk and all the contributions. And uh, so this has been amazing. Uh, <laughs> we, we can uh, we can entertain any questions if uh, or comments if somebody wants. I'm I'm trying to look at the uh, at the at the chat. Um, sure, I'm, you want to say I'm, anything, Dr. Huang? Dr. Huang. Uh, I'm so so surprised that Dr. McKees can correct so 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 much and contribution everything to me, but actually not. I'm just beginning to come to the UAB, you know, UAB and the uh, work close at the time they're doing the plasma exchange, but they we will not control anything. I just take care of the blood bank, but work close have a problem. They, they they want to treat the patient okay. If they're not treating, they just left. So <laughs> one time, so one time the, the children's hospital sent the patient to the UAB. And uh, 
uh, uh, to you will be uh, the emergency clinic, and and the and, and the other close coming to to do the for plasma forensis. But in the middle, they say they decided not want to do it. They left. So our children has a very angry, and then call our our the you know, chairman, the pathology chairman. But so the chairman said, why you not do it? I said, I said, it's a very close, we not do it. And so the, that's why the chairman said, you should do it. You already have a train in the New York Blood Center. You know how to do it. So that's why I start to set up the plasma phoresis. Photophoresis, we're talking photophoresis, it's the same thing, you know, it's because they, at that time, they, they are the, you know, the, Dermatology, chairman the dermatology, the uh, uh, the uh, transplant, uh, heart transplant surgery. They come and ask me to, can you set it up? We see the recent paper, eh? and I say, plasma exchange. I know I have a training, but water force is new. I don't know anything. They say you you should try it. So that's why I try. <laughs> but when I try, it's a fail. You know the the first. Uh, one or two patients, I, I forget it, uh, we treat, no effect. So I become to talk with the, the, the uh, dermatology cha uh, chairman, said, why why did they, they say so effect, but I try not working. And the chairman said, oh, because this is developed in the, in the uh, Yale. Why don't we go to Yale to take a look how they do it? So we went there and then take a look what they are doing. And very interesting story is, I found it out, Yale, the most concern is the red blood cell contamination because when you separate, if the too much red blood cells would absorb this UV light and, and loss effect. And then I find it out, the commercial they set it out is much higher than the, the, the Yale did it. The you know the commercials they set up eight I cannot remember exactly eight something and the, the they only did use about four almost half so I said oh that may be the reason why it's not working so when I come back I be begin in design and then bring it down to down to four and then see the effect and interesting at the time this is a new so not many areas have the uh, set up this one and so we set it up and we see the working. So becoming everywhere, the Florida, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, and the Mississippi all send the patient to us. That, you know, one time, you know. But so I know about if you do it, really do your effort to do it, do it you can overcome the problem. But I, I think I stop here because a lot of things I set it up, <laughs> really spend a lot of my time to, to solve the problem. But I want to say one thing. I, I thank you, the Marisa gives so much you know, the, the to, to me, I, I don't think I, I, I feel okay. I'm not, I'm just beginning to set it up, but really doing the work becomes the next step is Marisa. Marisa, this is it, it, coming about so so beautiful, so help of so many people, and also the whole United States. I really thinking about the, you know, which is thanks to Marisa develop this, and that I'm so happy she becoming to this kind of deal. Thank well, you. If, you. if you had not started, Dr. Wong, we would not be here. It's it 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 takes a it takes a village, but it takes somebody to start. So uh, we really appreciate that. As I well, want to also give credit to Dr. Zhang, who uh, who is now in Kansas, who really uh, helped us uh, a lot with the TTP and putting yes. our place on yeah. the map. And uh, he wrote, uh, I'm following Dr. Huang's footsteps. So great footsteps <laughs> to follow along. And uh, thank you all. OK, all right. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank Bye. you, Mr. Bye. Thank you Bye. very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.